Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Tammy Hotchkiss, and I'm the curator at the Origins Centre. In the past at Origins, our talks, lectures, and seminars have focused not only on scientific and archaeological research, but also on looking at current social issues, cultural perceptions and norms that are often rooted in the past. So we feel it is important to have this series of talks on looking at South Africa's cultural capital and mental health, especially as we deal with this terrible pandemic which has changed the way we live. We have worked with Dr. Kirti Ranchord on various talks in the last few years around mental health, wellness, and different cultural approaches to medicine and healing. And so we are delighted to, to partner with Kirti again for this, this series of talks now in the virtual realm, which focus on healthy aging in the brain, tapping into our cultural capital. These talks are sponsored by the Dana Foundation. In each talk, Kirti will be joined by artists, musicians, poets, academics, and thought leaders to discuss the power of art in its many forms and how art can help maintain good mental health. I will now introduce Kirti and our guest for today, the inspiring artist, Banele Kosa. Kirti Ranchod is a neurologist and Atlantic fellow focusing on brain health. Her expertise is on promoting brain health by making the latest research practical. This is in order to reduce the risk of illnesses such as dem dementia, depression, anxiety or stroke, which are increasing worldwide, and to promote health. Her approaches include creativity, calm, self-awareness and focus as essential elements for a healthy brain. Her interests include the role of traditional practices in promoting health, neuroaesthetics, and understanding the different perceptions of memory. Banele Kosa is a Swaziland-born, South African-based visual artist. He holds a BTEC in Fine Arts from Tswane University of Technology in Pretoria. In 2017, he won the prestigious Gerard Sokoto Award and with it, a three-month residency at the Cité Internationale de Art in Paris. His solo exhibitions include Temporary Feelings at the Pretoria Art Museum in 2016, Lonely Nights at Liza Moore Gallery in 2017, and Love at Smith Studio in Cape Town in 2018. Causa also headlined the solo exhibition titled LGBTQI Plus Banele Causa as part of the curatorial lab at Zeitz Maka in 2018. In 2018, he also curated a letter to my 22-year-old self a group show presented to launch his fundraising activities to give grants to art students dealing with economic hardship at South African universities. Thank you all for joining us this evening and enjoy the discussion. Over to you, Kirti. Thank you, Tammy. Really am excited again. So happy to be doing this series of talks because every time I do it, I'm excited. But I really am excited to be speaking to talented artist Banele Koza, and I think all our viewers will really appreciate his insights. Just very briefly, some background into this series of talks. Basically, we have a cultural capital that is rooted in our traditions and our cultures and manifests either in a traditional or contemporary setting. And this cultural capital is really a collected wisdom, ways of knowing and ways of living that have been handed down for generations. And as I said before, my focus is on how to keep the brain healthy in order to reduce the risk of certain illnesses, but also so that we function better in the world because we need a healthy brain in order to function in, better in the world. And so this cultural capital is an invaluable resource, an invaluable source of wisdom for us to tap into, to promote health, to promote healing, support healthy aging, and support healthy communities. I think I'm going to have a very interesting discussion with Benele. Please share your comments. And um, yes, I'm going to start now. Welcome, Benele. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. 
that will be our starting music for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the music I was playing. <laughs> Um, thank you for joining me, Vanilla. I'm really excited about the discussion we're going to have on art and health and healthy aging and brain health. So lots of um, interesting discussions that we've had that we can hopefully build on. Yes, and it's such a pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation. I really, really appreciate it. Excellent. I'm going to start with one of the things that I've been thinking about. And when I first saw your art, it was at the Turbine Art Fair. Yes. And if you think about the Turbine Art Fair, there's like thousands of artists, right? But, sure. And all of them are really great artists, right? This is like, it's, it's amazing art, amazing South African contemporary art. And something about your art speaks to me, right? There's something about you that's communicating to me personally, what do you think is actually happening in terms of process? Why don't I relate to all the other artists as genius as they were as well? Why do I relate to you in specific? What do you think? Uh, personally, I would say maybe it's because as I'm making, I'm actually trying to say something. So because it takes the format of almost like a diary or a confession, uh, I think the intention is to communicate. And I would say some people, when they create, they replicating an image to say something else. Um, so the message isn't a direct one from within to the surface, where mine is really just pouring into the canvas or pouring into paper. Um, because I'm mostly by myself, um, every day, I would say I've used the mediums as a way to engage in conversation. And I think that's why maybe a lot of people seem to resonate to the work. I, I think you're right. I think there is this visual conversation that's happening. And you're obviously tapping into some sort of uh, symbolic visual language that's yes. uh, communicating with me and I'm responding and so just taking that a little bit further, in terms of the power of visual art to communicate, what do you think it does differently from me and you speaking? And how does it potentially help people differently? Uh, I think it's interesting um, in the terms of, because I'm in the visual space like constantly, um, I feel like sometimes some of the communication I don't immediately um, engage the same way as someone who's from the outside because sometimes I've gotten used to the visual language of each artist that we predominantly see in the scene because it's a few times where you start to see um, new voices so for me it's always like an additional layer to the voice an additional layer compared to if I listen to something else let me say if it's a new artist in the music industry that for me is almost like an explosion of new content um experience and just i, I feel like in the visual scene i no longer feel as stimulated interesting um, as it interesting. is with poetry um, music and film and everything else because i think you almost become sanitized by what you see on a daily and constantly at yeah so and how about you on your side no i could relate to that completely which is i guess why i'm having conversations with artists versus conversations yes. with neuroscientists right it's that uh finding inspiration in fields that are not quite our fields you know yes. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> that makes sense that yeah. really makes sense and um who were your inspirations in terms of either artists or other in terms of finding inspiration and why was this important in terms of a creative process? Um, I would say in the visual sphere, um, very early on, artists that really provoked and expanded my thinking is Malin Dumas. 
um, Georgina Fredericks, um, I'd say Moshe Gualanga as well, Penny Siopis. Uh, I think in the same way I create, I imagine that they create the same as well, where they're almost secluded from everyone else when it comes to creating a new, a new body of work. Um, and I think that's a huge relation into a lot of other creatives, writers, um, and other spheres of, I would say, that require one to actually articulate something from within. Um, yeah, because uh, for in, in, the, in the sense of Moshe Gualanga, mm -hmm. I've met him, he's actually a huge loner, and his passion is being in the studio with right. no one else around. And I think that's why his work just revokes like new emotions each time you see his work. Because for him, that is, I'd say, his primary language as well. Yeah, and so I imagine it to be the same with everyone else. Primary way of communicating, really, in terms of yes. interacting, even with the outside world, even if he's not directly interacting with the world. Um, mm. And to go back to some of what you mentioned in terms of creativity and finding that inspiration. So I think of creativity as being a sign of a healthy brain and also necessary for a healthy brain in terms of the way we interact with the world. And yes. um, where do you think your, where do you find your creativity and how do you think this helps you or doesn't it help you? Um, where well, I find my creativity, um, I would say, it's so interesting because you never realize how much something affects you, first of all. And this for me is music and poetry, ah. where I'm constantly listening. I, I mean, you heard the backtrack at the start where there's music already. And throughout the day, I'll probably listen to the same album maybe five, six times. And... I, what I can tell immediately is I know the ease that comes with um, whichever album I'm listening to and for it to happen repetitively, it's because there's a sense of healing that it's giving me at that point or a specific emotion that I'm investigating. For instance, this week and last week, I've been listening to one album called um, Liana Le Havis, which is self-titled and... I'm transcending into different emotions of her journey and I'm not sure immediately where it's taking my brain visually, but there's a, a nice spot or place that I'm traveling with the song and the album. Um, and I can't tell you immediately what happens within that, but somehow I end up being inspired to create which I already am feeling um, today. I know I'm already preparing my workplace where I know I have to be back in studio. And just some of what you're saying from a, from a neuroscience perspective, just for, for interest, is um, what's fascinating about music, it's, it's exactly what you said. You know, it's, um, it's tapping into the limbic system, which helps us to process emotions, and yes. it activates the hippocampus, which, uh, is linked to memory and so really it's that triggering of that emotional memories and then how we process emotions and one of the mm -hmm. other things music does is it activates a network that helps us to focus called the salience network so we are able to mm -hmm. leave all distractions away which you described quite nicely in terms of the way you were describing the impact of music but it fits with mm -hmm. all the science that we understand about music and the brain as well Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned in our discussions before was understanding your own emotions in terms yes. of then being able to be creative. Would you like to explain mm -hmm. a little bit further? Uh, yes, definitely. I, I feel like, and sometimes I even complain to myself that I'm so emotional uh, because every day I'm examining like what emotion am I going through right now? And so for instance, if it's a heartbreak, I don't shy away from feeling it um, within myself. I, I think if it's just me in conversation with myself, 
I'll definitely explore the heartbreak, the pain, um, and everything that goes around that. And further, it then gets engaged with writing on my notebooks, writing on my cell phone, um, and often it inspires a painting as well. And to even understand it further, I'll probably play a backtrack song that's either healing or touching into the heartbreak and understanding someone else's heartbreak and how they dealt with it. And in this period now where I feel much more mellow um, and happy, it makes sense, the music that I'm listening to as well, where it's Liana Lehavis, um, it's Gregory Porter. Um, and I find Gregory Porter's album, I think it's 2012, it's, it's so invigorating in terms of just the beats. And also I listen to like um, with the best audio output um, in terms of the speaker or the headphones. Right. And I try to understand each beat and how it influences my, uh, I'll say my inner world as well. And at the end, it's just an outpour. Um, either in writing or painting or drawing. So from what I understand, you have a real understanding of what fuels your creative process, how to tap into your emotions to fuel this creative process. And yes. actually what you're describing repeatedly is the use of music in terms of tapping into this creative process. Mm -hmm. no, that's true. That is true. And what do you find decreases your creativity? decreases your creative process? Uh, <laughs> what decreases? <laughs> it's funny because I, I know exactly what it is. Um, first of all, it's my cell phone. Ah, um, so distraction. Yes, yes. It's a huge distraction because, um, and sometimes it's a good distraction as well because I feel like it fuels me in different spheres because I use my phone to socialize and I also use it to work and sometimes for research purposes. So because everything is blurred, I don't know when I'm in which mode. Sometimes I'm in all modes at the same time and I always feel like I just need to switch it off um, or place it in a different room. Or I think the most recurring um, feeling is just switching it off. Um, and then feeling the anxiety or just anticipating the next message where it's like, oh, but I'm really curious about who texted me now. <laughs> so then I run back to the phone. <laughs> but I know that if I switch off my phone, uh, I'm more creative. Um, or if my data is off, for instance, Sunday, um, I went, um, I did a picnic by myself. I didn't have data because I wasn't connected to the Wi-Fi. And I wrote a lot of memories, things that I recalled right. of previous experiences. And I couldn't have facilitated that with distractions. So I think also we get, we get that then the absence of distractions is so important for this creative process. Definitely. One of the things I was asked about recently and I'm hoping you can provide the answer because I could not completely provide the answer, was yes. many people in terms of the creative protest, uh, process, whether they're artists or not artists, have a very intense self-critical voice, right? This is not good yes. enough. You can't draw. You shouldn't draw. What are you doing with your time? So do you have that? And how do you either work with it or silence it? Like, how do you use it to actually help your creative process? Um, that's an interesting one. I, I think that voice probably a lot of creatives have. Um, I think for me where I feel it the most is in writing, where I haven't been able to share my writings because that voice has haunted me throughout my life. And I've been writing since I was probably six, seven years old. Right. Um, and I think I'm having a breakthrough of it closer to um this moment i think when i sent my writing to an editor she literally fixed 
I think probably just three paragraphs wow. and also a few things as well. Um, it was just like um, either a punctuation there or uh, trying to describe it at a better level. And that gave me confidence that actually I can write. I was just afraid that it wasn't good enough all along. Um, and also it was the doubt of who am I to identify as a writer. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had to get permission from someone. And I think that's when it really stifles you, when you can't even share um, to the public. But when it comes to painting, uh, I've understood that I can't control the outpour or the outcome. So whatever comes through, I'm normally just okay with it. It's just like, I feel like it has taught me to let go of control. And I think maybe the voice is also paired with control, trying to perfect whatever you're trying to do. While perfection is a forever process. So what advice would you give to people who have this critical voice in drawing? Because you've obviously were able to transcend it on a certain level. What advice would you give to them in terms of overcoming this? And especially since you understand the two processes in you, you know, with regard to writing mm. and painting and how different those voices are. Uh, um, to be honest, I would say it's just starting where you are and being okay with the imperfections. I, I think really the imperfections the, the strive for perfection is probably what hinders a lot of people from ever appearing in or showing up in whichever field that they destined for. Um, and, and I see it a lot with people, even with myself, where I'm still not participating because I feel like it's not good enough. But it's actually time and years that perfect the craft and the more you open it up to people the more you get different perspectives but because you're so caught up in your single perspective you just feel like it's not good enough i actually think that was advice for me actually the way you said it so thank you it wasn't my question it was from somebody else but <laughs> i could completely relate to it actually <laughs> I feel like I have to play it back to myself as well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes. um, the other interesting thing you mentioned was um, about perfectionism and the, the, the value of it on some level and then it's harm on some level. So yeah, how, how does that, because you sort of need an aspect of it to to make something excellent and beautiful. And at the same time, you need to yes. let go of the extreme of it, you know? So yeah, how do you, yes. how do, you do that? Um, <laughs> I've only figured out this year that perfectionism isn't the healthiest um, pursuit, to be honest. Um, and this is just seeing it, how it affects my relation to other people because I expect excellence and perfection from my side. Um, and I feel like the relationship that I have with myself, automatically it translates to the next person. Um, so I think when it comes to creativity, a lot of people get to appreciate it because um, it's a search that is at a different level um, compared to what a lot of people will just measure to be okay. Um, so for in the case of, um, I see it most in curation, where you almost have to have a sense of OCD as well uh -huh. that comes in, where you're striving, like for me, when I step into a room and something is skew, I can pick it up anywhere and it bothers me immediately. It's like, but that's cute. And for other people, that's okay. It's just, it's the nature and expression of the individuals in the space. But in my space, it has to be controlled. It has to be orderly. Um, and when someone described me in the past as a perfectionist, it was a compliment for me. It was like, 
great that's what i aspire for mm, mm. but now that i look at it again i'm like that can be very intimidating as well um to other people so i think in terms of creativity and excellency it it works it puts you um in a different bracket compared to others but at the same time i think you always have to check it back into your personal life where it doesn't then um become toxic to yeah. the other relationships yeah i'd like to also hear from your side what you think about perfectionism now i completely agree with you but i think where we struggle as you've mentioned also is finding that balance because um one of the stories i read and i haven't checked to verify it but it sounded believable was um monet used to throw away a lot of his paintings they were just not good enough for him because the construct you you're making in your head is not the same as what you're translating onto paper so even though the art is actually good you comparing it to what you wanted to create right and therefore it's not good enough and so he threw away thousands of paintings okay maybe i'm exaggerating maybe not thousands but i do wonder if that process of discarding also then encourages you to push beyond a certain limit so that you do achieve the sublime in art or in other mm-hmm. fields um mm-hmm. but yes it is a balance because if it stops you from creating uh, it defeats the purpose right mm-hmm. yeah. that is true that is very true yeah. yeah but i think also like that reach sometimes it just needs more years for you to get to yeah. where you can see the picture but it requires specific skills that your brain hasn't really picked up on yeah which you develop with yeah. practice um yes. and so in terms of again it was something with another discussion that i had and somebody else asked me after that discussion as well so in terms of both silencing this voice or achieving a state of flow there are people who use certain drugs such as cannabis etc in terms of achieving this um mm-hmm. i'm very conservative with regard to the use of it because i have seen quite harmful effects but what is your perspective on this in terms of creativity and in terms of health mm. um interestingly for me what of us fire to do or be an example of is the fact that you don't need um a specific drug to especially chemical drugs to to actually create but i also say this at the same time contrasting myself cuz um i'd say something like love love induces um chemicals to your brain mm-hmm. um i don't know if i'm correct if it's mm-hmm. oxytocin it is and yeah and that could be another search and i think for me at some point i just became almost like a love addict where i'm constantly seeking this feeling um which induces specific chemicals that will enhance the creation part so and that also is kind of unhealthy because you <laughs> but it is natural <laughs> <laughs> it, it is natural but it's just <laughs> also <laughs> not advisable uh but uh, i haven't um induced any other form of drugs or would i partition any other to to be in the space of creativity and right. i think even within myself i'm trying to be at a better space to create and not um cuz i think for me it was always unavailable love that i would find myself being drawn to but also i think that has a lot with to do with my childhood and my growth I was also trying to figure out that part of myself um and that's where my creativity has really been stemming for for the longest and now i'm just trying to see what happens if i'm independent of that interesting um and again it it i think you have so much insight in your creative process both in terms of understanding the impact of love and like you mentioned earlier the importance of processing and understanding your emotions and your use of music mm-hmm. 
So more than anything, there's an insight into, there's a self-awareness really as to what you need to produce art that may be different from what yes. others need. Um, mm. One of the other things that we were discussing was the value of anxiety versus calm. So, yes. I mean, I, I, I even give discussions on how to access states of calm and because, you know, but you provided a really excellent counter argument as to the value of anxiety in your creative process, yes. not only calm. Yes. Uh, that's interesting because I felt like the previous statement was short of anxiety because <laughs> <laughs> I, I do feel like um, what paired unavailable love was a huge strain of anxiety. Uh, right. And is it serotonin that you get from anxiety? Adrenaline or, and no adrenaline. Not, yes. And I feel like that space as well was another drive into making where just to calm it down for me I would have to make um, and so and often I would still say I do have um, performance anxiety where I know I have to be always working every day to a point where I did not know how to relax um, either like physically as um, in flash where I remember one photo shoot with um, someone I really admire um, and because they've shot so many people um, or portraits of people that she could tell that I'm not relaxed and they're like please relax and I'm like what do you mean I'm okay and they're like no you need to relax um, and I think that was the one time someone could spot that I'm not a relaxed being as much as I try to portray to be um, and, and definitely I would say every time I feel the anxiety to create or to perform it's just I would say my performance is almost doubled or tripled sometimes where I end up working at odd hours um, and also endless hours where even when I say to the team let's not talk about work. And our late it's me who's like, oh, did you guys see this? Um, right. So it, it's something I can't um, shift away from. But I think what you mentioned as well is that it's positive anxiety right. rather than a um, negative one. Right. Again, I think there's so much self-awareness to be able to work with your anxiety as opposed to saying, oh, this is bad. I better get to a state of calm and I have to be calm before I can do anything you've really used yes. this process to say, okay, this is helping me up to this point and beyond this point, it's going to become toxic, but you really have mm -hmm. found a way to, to work with what you have internally to create, which again, I think there's a certain magic to it. Uh, now, um, and maybe, can I just maybe add, yes, I, I think it's also an understanding of the body. I, I feel like there is an awareness on my side where, I know that I'm now I'm reaching a breaking point and I have to stop. Um, I, I would say in the last week or actually the last month, because I do remember we spoke about just the state of my anxiety. I was aware that now it's becoming to a point where I can't control it myself. So I have to seek out therapy. Um, and I think that is an awareness. And sometimes I will start to feel my heart um rhythms be irregular where i knew that i need to stop like being anxious right now and just calm down stop working and then i started initiating weekends to be off days because right. that point of productivity was just becoming too unhealthy um I do wonder how much your art practice has actually given you all this insights and understanding into yourself. Um, I'm just going to briefly discuss the neuroscience of art in visual art and art creation. Yes. And it activates a network in the brain that I refer to as the daydreaming network. But it's mm. the network that's active when you're daydreaming or when you're meditating or when you're creating art. And it helps with autobiographical memory with understanding self, understanding other, and just listening to you, I'm wonder, wondering if all your 
creative processes have actually led to your insights, which then help you to make better art. Yeah. I would say it's been further than the process of being present to making, I would say it's just being also present to the self, um, where you sit within yourself and understand what are you thinking about? What is going on within? I feel like a lot of people feel that time with other people where it's either they with family or constantly seeking uh, the comfort or acquaintance of friends uh, or the company. Uh, if not that, then they're doing social activities that involve others as well. So for me, I would say it might be inaccurate, but I would say 95% of my time I'm with myself. Right. And there's a lot of dialogue that happens where at some point I know that, okay, this content is for poetry. So immediately I grab a book and start writing it out because I know that it will be quite enhancing of that. And the point where I start having a feeling of like, okay, now you need to be painting because I feel as I'm almost like aligning to a specific energy that I know will be productive for painting. Mm -hmm. And the hours where I know this is the time for writing and I can't force those relations. I just have to be present to that understanding that this is what the body needs now. Um, and also the same with curating as well, curating um, the gallery or coming with a new concept. I'll probably be walking, but as I'm walking, I'm tuned in to what is happening and what is being connected by the brain. And the idea comes through and I translate it immediately to the team. Interesting, interesting. So I don't know if that answers the question. No, it did. It did. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on the imagine on your imagination and 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 supporting your imaginative process, which is related to your creative yes. process. Um, yes. But the value of boredom and procrastination, which yes. we would not necessarily see value in, you know, just uh, if I had to tell anybody. But the value of boredom and procrastination in this imaginative process. Yes. Um, on my side, uh, I think I induce boredom uh, consciously because I've been aware of how it really triggers and inspires creativity. Because, uh, and I think it, it's part of lessening distractions. So where I stay, um, when we're recording this, uh, I'm in Pretoria in a remote town that a lot of people even in Pretoria or even as three kilometers away aren't aware of this part of town right and what that has allowed is my friends maybe only come visit maybe once in three months or once a year and with all the time that I have to myself I'm basically present to my sense of imagination I'm present to my sense of creativity because I think what I've always been afraid of is distraction like greater distraction that involves another person coming into the space and almost disconnecting me from myself and what I have to be present for on a daily it's very interesting you say that because I think because of lockdown I'm normally yes. very active, outgoing, uh, lots to do, always busy. And because of lockdown, I have retreated. Firstly, it was forced, but mm. now it's still forced. But I've recognized the, the beauty of just having this quiet time um, mm. and not everybody else's stuff around you and not almost presenting yourself the way you think you should. So you don't have to worry about all of that. It's just you. It's just what you're working on and there's nothing else. And there's so much value in that process. I can completely see it after this lockdown period. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask what do you think it has induced 
for you? What has been the outpour from this time? So I think in terms of the quiet, it has allowed me to, I do draw and I paint, um, and it's allowed me to access a different process in terms of doing that. And even with regard to my work in terms of the neurosciences that I'm, I'm working on in terms of brain health, I find that because I'm not constantly distracted and constantly engaging with other people, it's, it's vague. It's like, you know, everyone's energies do actually have an impact on you and how you mm-hmm. think and what you produce. And just not having that has changed. It hasn't increased my productivity, but it's changed what I'm doing. And that's been interesting as a, a self-observation, actually. Yeah. And so I, I think going forward, I'm going to have to have self-imposed lockdowns where it's okay. Two months, I don't need anybody around. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not curious on um, personal chatter because I feel like your own brain can be what distracts you from your own work mm-hmm. where there's just so much chatter in the brain that you're trying to resolve that and trying to also be productive. And I think for me, it comes in the form of procrastination, where it feels like procrastinating, but maybe it's the brain trying to work out the codings or the new, I would say maybe the new stimulation that is being um, induced by the many forms of either a new TV show that you've been watching or music that you've been listening to or all the intakes. I don't know if would you say it's the case. No, I do. I do think there's value in procrastination also in certain processes, in certain mm-hmm. things that we have to achieve. But in terms of a creative or even problem solving space, I think procrastination helps your brain to process things on an unconscious level. At least mm-hmm. this is what I have found in, in myself as well that for some things they they you have a deadline and i'm one of those people who generally gets things done at least a week or two before my deadline oh wow <laughs> exactly i need mean, those thoughts <laughs> so, but getting it done the day before the deadline also helps actually because i've had an extra two weeks to process information right mm. so what i create mm. for different things and it ends up being different from what I would have done two weeks prior to that, because I've had a longer time Mm -hmm. to sit and process information, either consciously or unconsciously. So I I do find value in that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say maybe in contrast for me, where I would watch my procrastination habits was mostly varsity, where it was peak at peak, um, where I would procrastinate literally till the last day. And the worst day for me was probably an exam I had to write. It was my final exam for art theory, where I only started studying, I would say, I think it was six hours before. Oh my God. (laughs) Yes. And that was the worst for me because it was, I really wanted to study like, I desperately wanted to study, but my brain just could not um, find itself into that space. And when I finally did, I actually came out with an A. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's crazy to some level, but um, I, I, I got to admire my brain in, in that activity, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm, I may have to put a PG-13 <laughs> now, now that you've said this. Yes. yes. <laughs> Would not recommend it. <laughs> so going to the brain and recognizing its potential, what do you think yes. is a healthy brain? How would you describe it? What do you, what do you want your brain to do? Or how would you define a healthy brain? A healthy brain. Um, To be honest, I feel like I'm only starting to have a healthier brain um, after my recent engagements with my therapist, um, where I think what I've admired is speaking to someone who feels like a friend, 
but it's actually also helping with the wiring of your brain as well. They can see it more clearly than I can. And I think because I love filing stuff in my head and into my reality, there were things, especially emotionally related, where I couldn't file it properly. I would say if it was supposed to be in folder B, I would probably file it in folder P. And <laughs> with that, it just really um, affected how I engaged with others because it was the wrong filing system. And ever since I got to understand how childhood experiences inform my personality mm -hmm. and also how I engage, that for me has brought clarity where I feel now less anxious. And also I'm able to, because I think the other thing with creatives is we're natural givers and we're not, it's not easy for us to receive. Either it's a compliment or I would say even actually mostly compliments and any verbal affirmations. And, and I think that's what, it, it's also in contrast with the critical side of you where someone is like, that's a beautiful painting, but because you know the imperfections mm -hmm. of it, you immediately discourage the compliment. And for me, that's the same word where someone tries to affirm something that I'm doing personally. And it, the same voice would just also discount that compliment or the affirmation. And now I'm starting to learn how to accept that. And I think a healthy brain can give and also receive equally. So good I'm not there yet, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting there. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And what did you say is a healthy brain? Uh, I think I'm approaching it from a functional point of view um, in terms of the work yes. I do. But going back to what you said, that self-awareness and acceptance, it's quite important in terms of of a healthy brain, creativity mm -hmm. and critical thinking, right? So, because yes. you're doing that automatically in terms of both your creative process and in terms of how you're responding to the challenges that you have. So the question you asked yourself, I'm putting words in your mouth, but is how do I make this better, right? And so then to engage with the therapist, which does involve both self-awareness creative problem solving and critical thinking to think, okay, which are the steps I need to take? So I'm looking at it from a functional perspective as to how to, um, how to make all of this quite practical so that people develop these skills, including me, mm -hmm. including me. I think a lot of what I do is to either justify my behavior or change my behavior. One of the two. <laughs> yes, that is beautiful. That is really beautiful. Um, uh, <laughs> Art and healthy aging. What do you think the role of creativity, visual art, any art process and healthy aging? What do you think it is? Um, <laughs> to be honest, I feel, because I'm still so young, I, I, I don't know if I have the answer to the question, to be honest. Um, so, because. May I interrupt yes. you a second? Let's say yes. it was your parents and you had to tell your yes. parents to engage either going to galleries or, or drawing or however they engage with the art process. Why would you tell them that it's of value to them? Um, I think it, art creates a space for conversation. I, I think that's what has been really um, my my strive in creating like the space of conversing or relatability because when you relate to something it's almost like an affirmation that oh this is not only happening to me it's happening to the next person and i think when i see that happen or i feel people connect it's like loneliness if because loneliness it feels like a solitary experience 
when someone else tells you that they also feel lonely. It's like, ah, I'm not alone. And I think that then promotes healthy conversation around um, the topic um, or even just the sense of acceptance mm. that especially with a feeling like loneliness when you're like, oh, I'm not the only one going through this. And I think when you can have the data that 75, if for instance, 75% of the population that feels lonely at some point, you can have the data in your brain, but if you don't have the immediate person who tells you that, then I don't think it relates the same way. Yeah, completely can see it. It is that a sort of creating a community, even if you're not yes. actually speaking to people and that community then encourages support and helps you in terms of your daily life. Um, and I would actually also add social media. Uh, mm -hmm. I think for me, if I didn't have that element, um, I think I would feel more secluded, I would say. I, I think having the community on social media in some way makes me feel more connected um, to others because I get the immediate feedback, either it's a like or comment or direct message or even a further conversation when we meet um, in public. And to be honest, sometimes I feel more connected with social media than the people around me, which um, can be slightly problematic when <laughs> they experience you in that engagement. Yeah. You obviously just need to have all your relationships virtually. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's working in lockdown. <laughs> Um, part of what I'm doing also is looking at the cultural capital that we have and how the cultural, cap uh, the cultural capital that we have actually supports health. So like visual art, music, dance. And I think um, across the world, I'll just focus on South Africa and Southern Africa, but it's across the world. We have a very rich artistic contemporary and traditional art form, you know? Um, and I just wanted to know how you tapped into this in terms of it and what's your opinion on the, 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 the cultural, the artistic culture within Southern Africa? Mm, I think we're very lucky, to be honest, to also be able to engage with um, the Northern Hemisphere in terms of the fact that we have immediate access to global news mm -hmm. and just global trends as well. I feel like it has really harnessed um, our creativity where we're no longer creating um, into a solitary perspective as much as um, people outside from Africa can say, oh, that is kind of like still, or have the perspective of Africa being um, in the primitive phase. But when I realize and understand global culture, I feel like we're really in the same conversation. And sometimes even at a higher um, or a more informed and also a more concentrated um, conversation. Uh, just looking at the response right now into African art, where a lot more European galleries and even just the international market is really looking and supporting um, African art. It says a lot about where we're at. It also says a lot about the quality where if we're having the voice right now, it means there's so much that we have to say. And also there's so much that is uh, 
I would say even like what's immediately influencing us. Um, so before we end, I know you have an online yes. exhibition currently. Do you want to share a little bit about it and um, the links? Yes. Um, so the, the upcoming show is called In My Fields. And um, it, it, it's actually works that I've made from a period of 2017 till today. Um, and the search has been through the mediums of my tablet um, and also cell phone, which have taken the space of my diary. And I would say the exploration is the same that I would have given my diary, but it's also um, a slightly less condensed because I deal with distractions in the period as well. Um, and I, I would say it's really just a study of how I felt or I've felt in the past three years in response to unavailable love. Ah. And yeah. I and, can see I'm going um, to relate to that completely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the interesting thing is that I was hoping the next body of work would be love with the full stop. But I had to understand the unavailability to better help me seek for available love. And right. it will be available on my website. So for and our viewers, search. it's to understand and appreciate the beauty of unavailable love to go through to your, your latest online exhibition. Um, please send yes. me the link so I can actually attach it to this. I'll definitely do so. Yeah. And is there anything you else so you would like to this. share with our, with our viewers before we end? Um, I would say for me in this period, I think it's color that has to maybe be introduced into our spaces and how I think just the understanding of colors that bring calm to your life. Um, I mean, if you look at my background, my mm. walls, um, some of them are green, some of them are pink, uh, varying to each room. And I think with that, I understood how that color would make me feel. And this was done a year ago, this project of recoloring my space, but I cannot like tell you enough how it has helped is this period of lockdown for me. Right. And I mean, I'm constantly in this one space, but the experience each day, some days I feel like I'm in a resort, some days I feel like I'm hotel living, some days I really feel at home because of the experience of color. And really color and textures have got, um, they really just lift one's vibration. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for in this period. Thank you very much, Penele. This was just such an excellent discussion. I'm looking forward to our next one. I'm going to have to find an excuse now to actually have another discussion with you. I learn something I, new I every time I speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say you even need an excuse. I'm always happy to speak okay. to you. Like, <laughs> I'm also looking forward to further conversations. <laughs> excellent. Thanks, Penele. Yeah. No, thank you so much. What a beautiful discussion with artist Panele Koza. Every time I speak to him, actually, I get new insights. And I really, really am looking forward to the next discussion I have with him. Enjoy his online exhibition. And join me next week where I discuss music and health, particularly our musical heritage with Bongiwe Lusizi from the Eastern Cape. Thank you all.